Hey everyone, it's Mark Sabatella. Sorry. Mark Sabatella from Mastery Music Score here, and welcome to the Music Masterclass. Uh, this is my series we do on Thursdays where we talk about some aspect of creating music. We take a look at some music, see how it's put together, talk about all sorts of stuff involving composition, improvisation, arranging, playing by ear, any of the sort of creative acts of making music. That's, that's what we do here. So uh, uh, we're going to just be focusing a little bit we've been for the last few months focused on um the uh the harmony and chord progressions course which is you know now over and so uh that course I, we had a great time doing it i hope uh, those of you uh who are here who were uh participating in that got a lot out of it and we're kind of going to ride that momentum going forward but talk about other topics uh, also, and work on different kinds of music and um, in preparation for our next kind of cohort, which is going to be on my counterpoint course. So we're going to start that up in another month or so. I don't have an exact date yet, still working out some logistic details on how I want to do things. But as those of you who are gold level members have seen, hopefully I did post a project idea, which is to work on an SATB arrangement. Uh, it could be a choral arrangement, but it doesn't have to be a choral arrangement. You know, you can do whatever you want, and we'll talk about the, the music that, you're, that you all are working on. But as something uh, to kind of keep us on the same page and talking about some of the same issues and so that we, uh, I don't know, can all be corresponding in the same dialogue, I'm going to be focusing for the next few weeks here on SATB. So, for those who aren't familiar with what I mean by that, S-A-T-B, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. That is the basic idea of uh, what goes on. And um, well, I'm going to load up a score that, you know, I happen to have handy uh, that I've used as a demonstration before for the uh for as a mu score demonstration but it also makes a, a reasonable demonstration of some uh whoops that's not the yeah that is the folder i want to be in sorry um it's i want to talk about how this piece relates to the idea of what I mean when I talk about SATB. And so this piece is a piece for four voices. Well, for a choir. I mean, I, I envisioned this piece being sung by a choir, but there's already a distinction you get to make. Four voices doesn't necessarily mean four people, right? It means four parts. So this particular piece here, uh, I did just as a muse score demonstration to show how to do a, a, a choral part. And I did a whole, a whole demonstration of how this music was entered. It's part of my mastering muse score for course. It's at the end of the course, you'll see the use case, uh, the use case tutorials. This is one of them. And the idea here is this piece, I'm, I'm going to play it in sections here and just talk about what's going on and what I think you all might want to take from this and perhaps, you know, see how you can be incorporating in whatever it is you want to do. Um, so the first part of the piece is what I would call a chorale style. All the parts have essentially the same rhythm. Yes, there's some passing tones here and there. Um, passing tones here and there where like the melody might have a long sustained note while some of the inner voices might move to create a sense of motion. That's a very common thing right there to be aware of that sometimes if the melody has a long note, other voices want might want to move just to create some motion. You can either have chords actually happen underneath that or just treat them as passing tones. So this first part is that. So let's take a listen to that, what it sounds like. So that's basically a chorale, right? Uh, it's all the voices moving together rhythmically for the most part. Next phrase, same story. So usually, um, is that, I have my volume turned up loud enough from my perspective. 
<clears throat> um, sometimes if I haven't set up things properly, let me, let me check this out with my other headphones and just try that again. Yeah, I can just turn it up a little louder if you want. Anyhow, um, it's not that crucial that we hear every single note of what's going on here. I'm giving you a general idea of what's happening, but feel free to just turn up your turn up your volume. Um, and it's always the case, unfortunately, that music coming through live streams struggles a little bit with some of the uh, I just want to do this again here <laughs> and make sure that all my optimizations that are designed to create good results are in the best shape they can be. All right. Um, so when we talk about SATB writing, typically you hear people talking about that sort of thing, corrals, where all the rhythms are moving together. But it is by no means the only way to do it. And so first of all, let me back up to something I, I mentioned before. Four parts doesn't mean four people, right? This could be sung by literally a quartet, a vocal quartet, and that is a thing. But more typically in vocal music, you'll have a larger ensemble, multiple sopranos, multiple altos, multiple tenors, and multiple basses. Keep hold on to that thought because we're going to come back to it when we talk about instrumental music. Um, so usually when we talk about SATB music, we're thinking about this chorale style, but when you look at actual vocal music, uh, probably the majority of it is not just that. And when I say the majority of it, I'm going back to the Renaissance and forward to the 21st century and looking at the whole entirety of choral music. So this next section of the piece is more contrapuntal. And what you can see is each of the voices comes in at a different time, different rhythms happening at once. Specifically, there's some imitative counterpoint going on. It's using, uh, you know, that type of technique where uh, summer fall you're going to hear in the soprano and then you're going to hear the tenor summer fall you're going to hear the the tenor sing the same exact part a fifth lower very typical device that we'll study a lot more in the counterpoint course so i'm just going to play this passage and then let's talk a little bit about what's similar between them and what's different between them all right and again uh we're just going to go with it uh you know just don't worry about it if you can't hear every single note that's not important <laughs> So even just following it along uh, sheet music wise, you can see all the different things going on, right? There's eighth notes going on in one voice uh, where while no one else has anything, then there's eighth notes going on in another voice while the other voice has the dotted quarter figure, two eighths and a quarter while another one has dotted quarter eighth. Here's a place where uh, one voice has and another one has and another one has I'm sorry, I'm not singing that at all right. Ba -do -do -ba -dum. So we have different rhythms, and not just that, but in this case also, because it's imitative counterpoint, it's also different lyrics being sung at the same time. That's going to be a very typical thing when you have counterpoint in vocal music it's going to mean you're not going to everyone have the same lyrics. And so one of the things that's uh, um, uh, you have to keep in mind is in vocal music, you typically do want to understand the lyrics. And so there is a whole kind of complication, I would say, that comes up if you want to write counterpoint for voices. because it does mean if you have different rhythms going on, independent parts at the same time, it's going to be harder to make out the lyrics, right? So that's just a fact of life. Therefore, 
what you typically find historically is one of two things happening. Either nonsense lyrics, right? Fa la 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 kind of stuff, or ooh, ooh, ooh. that's a little tougher because you don't have the consonant in there, do, 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 whatever. Nonsense uh, lyrics uh, where you're basically treating the voice more like an instrument, or you have uh, the lyrics so well known to everyone that it's not that important that they make out every word because they kind of know the piece already. This is how in the Renaissance you could do things like have all the parts of a mass. I mean, people go to church every week and hear holy, 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 uh, Lord God Almighty, all, all the different Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, all that stuff in Latin, of course, Agnus Dei and, and, and all the different uh, Agnus, I, I don't even know how to pronounce Latin. Um, uh, the, the prayers that you would hear week after week set to music, then even if they're one person singing lamb and the other person singing God at the same time, you already know what's going on. You already know the prayer. So this is one way that this has uh, been possible to talk about counterpoint in the context of vocal music and not have it be chaos, is either have nonsense lyrics or have... Uh, lyrics that are just so familiar, it's not a problem, or just choose to go with it and say, you know what, this passage is going to be hard for people to make out, and that's okay. You will see that in opera sometimes, right? You'll see passages of like a Mozart opera where they do some sort of counterpoint, the, you know, they, they build to a fugue at some point. I mean, that is definitely a thing that happens in opera. It's like a conversation. It's like the thing that you see in movies and TV shows when they decide, you know what, we are going to deliberately have two people talking at once because that happens in real life also. And let's just do that, set it to music. It's going to be cool. And if people don't make out every word, we'll, we'll do what we can to try to make this work out anyhow, right? So that's a logistic thing to know. Now let's talk about the actual musical aspect of what's going on with this. It's still the case. I mean, if you study the basic rules of, of harmony and, and, you know, if you review in the Harmony and Chord Progressions course in the, the first chapter where I talk about voice leading and chord voicing and all the things that have to do with how we write for four voices, it's going to apply whether we're talking chorale style or whether we are talking about um, counterpoint. So let's just take a look at one of these measures here. Um, beginning. This, if I follow each one of those lines, they're moving nicely by step, right? This line happens to have a leap in it. Um, now, there's a question that would come up. Why leap here? So let's take a look at it. Let's take a look at this example right here. It's a great example. I didn't, I, I didn't plan it that way, but we have a C chord, the one chord, right? Then we have a G chord, the five chord in second inversion. Then we have basically a six chord, right? An A minor chord. And the third is in the bass and it's doubled. Well, why? Why is that? Why didn't I not put, you know, I can see why, hopefully you can see just by following the bass line, why the bass has the C. That's a nice bass line there. So, of course, it made sense, given that line, to have a C in the bass. But why does the tenor have a C? Why does the tenor have a C? Why doesn't the tenor have an A? One of the things you typically learn is, well, when in doubt, double the root. And if this chord is an A minor chord, which is perhaps debatable, but let's accept for now that it is an A minor chord. Why not make that an A? Why not make that chord an A? Why not do that? That's my question for you. Someone is going to spot the answer. Um, so 
Uh, what we are looking at today, uh, Swabu, is um, uh, we're looking at some SATB music. Uh, this we're looking at. Uh, this happens to be a piece of mine, um, but it could just as well have been any other chorale type piece. We're talking about writing for four parts. And Kevin, you nailed it, right? If I had an A here, then perfect fifth, perfect fifth. I would have parallel fifths between my inner voices if I had put the A there. So stepwise motion is great. We like stepwise motion for sure, but we like avoiding, oops, uh, I meant control Z. Um, there we go. Um, we like avoiding parallel fifths at least as much as we like stepwise motion. And um, so I'm okay with having that leap there in order to avoid that parallel fifth, right? So these are the decisions we make all the time when writing music in four voices like this, or what actually whether it's four voices or three or two, that doesn't really change. Um, so um, it's, so I don't, I'm, I'm gonna also, a lot of you have heard me go on this soapbox before. I'm gonna go on it a little bit here. Never think of any rule of music as being about something being forbidden because it just doesn't exist. You write whatever you want. Rules in music, as I usually say, are like the law of gravity. The law of gravity tells me if I take this glove and drop it, it's going to fall. Gravity tells me that. It doesn't tell me whether I should drop it or not. Gravity doesn't care if I drop this glove or not. It doesn't care if I let it drop all the way onto the keyboard. It doesn't care if I catch it before it hits the keyboard. It doesn't care if I throw it up in the air and then catch it, right? It doesn't, gravity doesn't care what I do. It tells me what's going to happen if I do certain things, right? So parallel fifths are like that. Music doesn't care if you write parallel fifths or not. But if you write them, they're going to sound like that. That is just the way it is. Parallel fifths are going to sound like that. Then you get to decide if in the context of the music you're doing, if that is the sound you want. If you're writing, if you're writing, um, you, I, whatever, Beatles. I'm just talking rock and roll, parallel fifths are all about what guitars do. It's a, it's a thing. It's absolutely an accepted and expected even thing in uh, how rock guitar works. And so there's, it's a genre thing that tells you whether that sound is going to be the thing that you want or not. All right. So now let's take a look at the more contrapuntal section. And this is, you know, I'm not going to go deep into counterpoint talking about this section here, but um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, because that's what we're going to talk about in the counterpoint course. But I want to point out that even though I'm writing counterpoint uh, here, that we're still going to care about a lot of the same issues. All right. And uh, Dave, you're asking uh, when the chords are more complex, do the parallels stand out? And no, they won't. That is absolutely, a, that is an excellent, excellent point. As we deal with more complex chords, we start adding sevenths more consistently. We start adding other color tones, ninths and thirteenths and so forth. Then these uh, the parallels that exist won't be as noticeable as they are in triads, where frankly, your parallels are going to be between the root and the fifth of the chord. That's usually what's going to happen. It's usually going to happen. Um, uh, um, you're going to, yeah, you're going to, you're, what am I saying? Yeah, if you write, uh, was that the case here? This was the case here, right? This was the, those parallel fifths was between the root of the G chord and the fifth of the G chord, and then the A minor, the 
root of the A minor and the fifth, right? That's where you're going to have these, is between the root and the fifth. And as Allison is saying, sometimes if you're just sketching in some harmony, just playing roots and fifths in your left hand on the piano or organ or whatever keyboard instrument you're doing, and then playing a melody on top of it. Uh, I'm not claiming that's great harmonization. No, but it, it's kind of practical to just, you know, the left hand kind of likes to play fifths overtone series wise. They're happy to be played down low. And very often you'll see piano music that really does, that does basically maybe like arpeggiate like I did, but play chords in root position and have some parallel fifths. So yeah, there's all sorts of contexts in which those parallel fifths will be like, yeah, I don't care so much, right? So it's all about context. That's, uh, and so not even just genre, but genre and context, because it's not hard at all to find examples of Alberti bass going. I know, I know I'm playing a ridiculously simplistic chord progression, but I, but I think you can get the idea that it, if you're playing, um, or if you're playing big chords, Right? That kind of thing, that root, the, you'll, you'll get that all the time. Piano, piano parts in which the bass is doubled in octaves and has a fifth between them. And it's just super common. It's all over the place. I, I did a whole video just showing that uh, maybe a month back, I think. Uh, piano fifths, I called it. Go look it up. Piano fifths was the video I did. It was, uh, it was my in theory uh, feature in the newsletter about a month ago. So, um, so coming back to this counterpoint section here, I'm thinking about a lot of these same issues. Even though I'm writing counterpoint, it doesn't mean the basic kind of rules, as you will, or the, the conventions of four-part writing. They don't go out the window. So if we look at, say, the first measure where all four voices are in, which is right here, this measure right here is the first measure where all four voices are actually sounding at once. So in that passage, I'm not going to claim I didn't do anything that um, someone would, you know, that in another context wouldn't be okay. Like, are there any parallel fifths or, or anything in here? I'm not positive, to be honest. I don't think so. I do remember someone calling me out on a hidden fifth somewhere, a hidden octave somewhere. And I, I that's when you leap into a fifth, but you didn't come from another fifth or leap into an octave, but didn't come from another one, that's even easier to get away with um, as far as context goes. But like, think about what's going on here. This is what we call an open voicing, right? This is a C triad in which the notes are spread out, right? They're not this, this, or this. So many times people get Mm, hoodwinked by, uh, they, they get misled by in imprecise teaching, I'll put it that way, to think that root position C chord means C E G, first inversion means E G C. No, first inversion does not mean E G C. It means anything with E on the bottom. It could mean E C G. It could mean E E E E G C, right? It could mean lots of different arrangements of those notes as long as the third is on the bottom that's first inversion right so um in any case this chord here is a second inversion c chord ah allison's found me some parallel fifths i look forward to finding them look forward to finding them i love it okay um so we have uh, an open voicing. It's called an open voicing because those notes are spread out. When they're all together like this or all together like this, that's called closed position. This is called open position. This is also open position here. And the gap between this B and the tenor and the G is more than an octave. One of the things you learn about when doing SATB writing and reading about voice leading and chord voicing and all that is to try to keep all your notes within an octave other than between tenor and bass. That's the one place where it's generally considered acceptable to have wider gaps. So I do want to um, 
pivot to talking about instrumental music in a little bit, and it becomes that much more important to think about these sorts of things. But um, uh, the um, the your having a gap between the bass and the upper voices is is not a bad thing. It creates a nice balanced sound. And it all has to do with the overtone series and the fact that when you play a low note, we're hearing all these overtones above it. And we don't want to get too many notes too low. Uh, the, that's uh, one, what, if you have too many notes too low, their overtones start conflicting. It gets a very complex and muddy sound. And yet we like the bass to be nice and low. So rather than saying, hey, all the voices have to go down low if the bass gets low, let's just let the bass be more than an octave away from the tenor. It's just it's just going to be more practical. So that's really common. So uh, I want to find um, I want to find the um, the the uh, parallel fist. But first, I want to address uh, Dave's comment. And actually, I would say, no, piano music is typically going to have close voicing in the right hand because your hand can't stretch more than an octave. I mean, barely more. But realistically, we play chords of an octave. And in the left hand, we play chords of an octave. But we might spread out between the chords very far, right? That kind of sound is going to be big in piano music or instrumental music in general. The vocal ranges are such that, you know, basses, this is kind of like a low note for a bass. This is, say, a high note for a soprano. And even if we, you know, if we put the tenor up here, everyone's going to be within an octave just because of the vocal ranges. So we're going to still have open voicing, but it's just based on what the actual vocal ranges are yeah, we're not often going to get into these situations where you need to have, you think you need to have crazy wide gaps, unless your soprano is getting super high, right? So, um, so let's so let's talk about um, uh, what uh, Allison's talking about. First two car chords in bar fifteen: bass and treble. Um, bass and treble. Oh, so what you have here? No. First two chords. Oh, well, that's... Okay, so this is a thing. This is a thing to talk about here. Does it count if it's really a repeated note? Does that count as parallel fifths when the note is repeated? This is going to be one of those context things, and it's a really good point because... Sometimes, yeah. I mean, but obviously, it's pretty super common to have the full chord just repeat like that. If you have a lot of syllables and you really don't want to change chords, that's going to be super common going back 500 years or so. Um, however, if the chord changes, then you probably, but two notes happen to stay in common between them then yeah, you do want to think about, did you, does that repeated note between those two chords cause a problem? In this case, the chord is not changing. However, the voicing is, right? It's changing from this to that. And um, this is a valid point, given that the alto moved should some other note have moved also to avoid that sound, the repeated G against D. To my ears, not a problem. And again, if the alto had stayed the same, then that would be, you know, a no brainer going, you know, going back again, centuries, pretty much any composer would accept uh, the repeated chord like that. But if you're going to change one note of the voicing, typically we would change more notes in the voicing. I chose not to. Someone else writing this piece might look for other alternatives, and that would be completely legitimate. Um, to my ears, not a problem. But definitely one of the questions you ask yourself. Often composing is a, que is a process of asking yourself questions. Asking yourself um, 
does this thing that theory tells me is something I should look out for, do I hear it as problematic? And then you actually listen to yourself play it or sing it or whatever, music or play it and ask yourself, does this thing do, th does that do the thing that parallel fifths are infamous for? This sort of crude sound of, I don't know how else to describe it. Um, not as a pejorative, but just as a description. It's a hollow sound. Um, and it's kind of cool in the right context. Does this create that same sound in your ear? And if so, then don't use it. Unless that's the sound you want. To my ears, not an issue. But these are, yeah, again, great questions to ask yourself. All right. So um, I'm I am looking out in this piece for these parallel fifth things. And I think that is why, for instance, uh, yeah, it has a lot to do with a lot of the voicing choices. Like, why do I have this kind of oddball voicing to begin with? A B and a D, a G and a G and a B with this closely spaced here on the bottom, closely spaced there on top with a big gap in between. That is not, uh, not a sound that I would have normally chosen. You know, why didn't I write this? Why didn't I give the alto the G to begin with? It's about to get the G. Why didn't I give the alto the G? Well, I don't know. Let's see. I must have considered it because obviously I moved the alto to the G later. Clearly, I wanted that G there. If I had written this, would there have been a problem? If I had written that G there, look at the soprano and alto. In this case, the parallel fifths would have been between the alto A and the soprano E, and this E is a non-chord tone, right? That parallel fifth there, some people would say is less problematic. And again, it's one for your ears. Parallel fifths between chord tones, when we actually have the root and fifth of the chord and then the root and fifth of another chord, like, like, uh, like I started to have over here when I went. This was the root and fifth of the root and fifth of the G chord, root and fifth of the A minor chord. That type of parallel fifth between two chord tones sounding together, definitely more problematic than this one, where um, not only, so first of all, that E is a non-chord tone, it's just a passing tone, and it happens on an offbeat, and you don't hear it sounded at the same time as the A. The A comes in on beat four, the E comes in on the and of four. So then you get to ask yourself, does that bother me? And you can also ask yourself, does the presence of the C, the seventh of the chord, which creates an interesting dissonance, right? The D to C between the tenor and the bass, resolving, you know, two to five in the typical way. Um, uh, does that two seventh, right? A seventh chord resolving, seventh coming down. Does that sound overpower that sound in your ear? Does the pleasantness of a seventh chord resolving the usual seventh chord way, that dissonance resolving to consonants by step, all the things it's supposed to do. Does one, does one hear that and say, you know what, I, that is what my ear hears and it doesn't notice that. Again, good question to ask yourself. I think pretty clearly I asked myself that question or I would have written the G. To be honest, I don't know if I asked that question and said, you know, I don't like it. Here's what I think happened. I think I wrote the G first said, you know what, I like it fine that way, but then noticed the parallel fifths and said, someone's going to call me on that. <laughs> and someone is going to call me on it, and then I'm going to have to give this lecture, and I don't feel like it.
So I think that's what happened. I think I originally wrote a G and then chickened out. I think I, I uh, decided that even though I don't mind the sound of the G, I'm going to go with a B. <sighs> These questions come up all the time. This is the, the stuff you spend your time thinking about. It's not always about parallel fifths, but all these issues, doubling, you know, is this the note I want doubled in that chord? Is this spacing going to be okay? Am I getting too high with that alto part? All these things that, you know, practical considerations. So at that on that note, I am going to pivot now to talking about instrumental music a little bit. And I'm actually going to, at first, look at another one of my pieces here. And this is the one that we hear, hear every week at the beginning of, uh, of the show. Uh, and, and that is my uh, theme piece here. And this is for string quartet, right? Well, string quartet is essentially SATB, right? Violin range starts at a low G. Low G is lower than you would typically write for sopranos is you know when writing for choir if you were writing for choir you might write altos all the way down to the f or the e even depending on you know what you think your choir can handle you wouldn't limit yourself to a g when did i write limit what's the lowest note i gave my alto I, I wonder my alto i don't see the oh the alto's got a g here does the alto go any lower than that? No. So I, I could take this piece and rewrite it for string quartet, and it would probably work just fine since I'm not asking the alto to go below that G. The lowest note for the viola is this C. Well, that's typically the lowest note you write for tenor. Again, if I flip over to my piece, did I write for tenor any lower than that? I tend to doubt it. Um, the lowest note I see in the tenor part is maybe, uh, that F, I don't know. Um, so, um, the lowest note for these instruments kind of mimics the human voice. Violin and v violin is somewhere between a soprano and an alto. And so you can, it can work for both. Viola is more or less like a tenor. Yes, real tenors might go a little lower. Viola is not. And you just are okay with that. Cello can go all the way down to this C. That's lower than you'd normally ever write for a bass. So cello, you're already good with bass. So if you're thinking about typical ranges and writing an SATB type of format in terms of thinking about voicing and spacing and so forth, uh, you can translate this to string quartet pretty easily it's just gonna it's just, it's just gonna work right um and notice that i'm thinking here about the bottom note only and not talking about the top note why is that well because the top note isn't going to be an issue the human voice when we write for soprano and say that its range is like maybe here to here you i mean yes solo soprano you might go higher now but in qu choral writing you don't write more then about a, a 10th, 11th, maybe a 12th, right? That is as high, that is as much range as you would typically write in a choral piece. Because otherwise you're pushing the ranges and some of the people aren't going to be able to sing it. And some of the people who do sing it aren't going to be able to balance. The note's either going to be so low they can barely eke out the sound or so high they have to scream to get it. And it, it's you're going to have balance problems if you push the ranges. So vocal wise you're not going to want any more than about a 12th but for violin that's not a problem you can go way higher than that and same with uh viola viola is going to be able to go way higher like you know that's the high note in um uh Nessim dorma right uh um this is a high note for tenor super high operatic tenor note but it's not all that high for a viola viola can play that note no problem Right? It's only barely higher than the top string uh, of the viola. So um, you never have to worry about the top end if you're writing, if you're thinking SATV ranges and you want to translate to string quartet. So, um, and so uh, Dave makes the uh, observation that the same exact thing is going to hold for a wind quartet. And you're absolutely right. In fact, I have that. I've got, I've got a clarinet choir version here. I have a wind, I don't remember what my wind choir version is. Let's hear my wind version here. 
Um, I just took the same piece. I think this is when Muse sounds came out and I just wanted to hear what it sounded like in different sounds. Um, so I just uh, took it and recast it. I have a clarinet choir version, a saxophone quartet version. So this is flute, clarinet, horn, bassoon, right? Uh, horns are typically found in mixed things because they're, they're, they're considered to blend well with woodwinds. Uh, and that's why also horns are, well, that's one reason anyhow, horns are typically written at the top of the brass section in an orchestral score is because they often are voiced along with the woodwinds because they have somehow a more woodwindy kind of sound in, in, the, in the right context. So anyhow, here is what this piece sounds like for this particular ensemble of flute as my soprano, clarinet as my alto, horn as my tenor, and bassoon as my bass. Does it have muse sounds? Doesn't have muse sounds. Well, let me just flip it over to muse sounds because I'm gonna be curious if I can do that. Oh, you're right, Dave, that the flutes are not gonna go as low. Uh, oh, and it's, yeah, so this was set before Mu Sounds was even a thing. Uh, so I would have to select these things individually, and I'm not going to worry about it because it's not that. Yeah. So Mu Score is very nicely telling me exactly what Dave pointed out. This B grace note, that A grace note flute doesn't have those you can kind of get a b uh well it depends on the flute but yeah but the a you're getting into no to just nope territory right so if you've written four satb ranges thinking about soprano as being middle c then you're okay with this but from a practical perspective that low c on the flute does not speak very well um uh it's it takes more time for this air to get all the way through the flute, the way your embouchure has to go in order to get that. So, so it typically comes out quieter and more slowly than other notes and harder to play like in a faster moving passage in the same way that for a soprano to hit that C doesn't have those same constraints. I'm not saying a flute can't play that C. Of course it can. But that middle C is, is like a note you have to think twice about using for flute in a way you don't for soprano. And so then you do get to do things like what Dave is talking about. Would we be better off taking this piece and moving the flute part up an octave? Well, maybe. Maybe I only do it for that opening passage and consider that to be okay. So this is actually really good discussion here. So, um, and yes, the B extension is absolutely a thing. I know, I, I know that you can get a B on a, on a flute with a B extension. Um, so I took this thing up an octave, but in doing that, let me flip it over to concert pitch also. Somewhere I have a shortcut for that. There we go. Um, uh, you notice that now I have taken that flute and it is now more than an octave above the clarinet. So the question is, is that okay? Is it okay that, remember when I was just talking about these gaps and how a gap between the tenor and the bass is considered okay, but other gaps can be more problematic? So here's what's happened. By taking the flute up an octave, but leaving everyone else where it is, the flute is now overbalanced, right? It's, it's too loud. It's not in the shrill range of the flute, but it's definitely in the power range of the flute. And the clarinet is sitting here in the nothing range. I mean, this, these are boring nothing notes for a clarinet. And horn is just, these are just low notes for horn. So, and of course we're hearing muse scores playback and I'm going that that clarinet is louder than it actually would be in real life. That clarinet playing, because remember this is F sharp, this is E concert, but it's F sharp. F sharp is one of the quietest notes there is on a clarinet. Um, that note against that high B, they're never going to fit. So Allison has an idea here, which is to take the clarinet part up an octave also. And you can absolutely do that. Um, I'm going to play it that way. But again, I don't want to trust MuseScore's playback. 
So what's happened now is we have this big gap between the alto and tenor parts, right? So we've created a big gap somewhere, right? As soon as you take one of the parts up, unless you take the entire thing up, in which case you lose your bass, <laughs> um, you're going to have issues. So here's what I'm going to do. Instead of taking the clarinet up, I'm going to, this is, this is a trick. This is a good trick to know about. Uh, this is like worth the price of admission, which was zero. Um, the, um, the trick is I'm going to exchange the horn and clarinet and change the octave. So let's look at that first chord. The first chord as originally written was this, right? G sharp for the bassoon, E for the horn, E for the clarinet, B for the flute. I took the B for the flute way up there I'm, I'm, I'm going to go to the second chord because since both these notes have an E, it's going to be confusing. Let's look at the next chord. The next chord was this, A, A, E, C. Instead of just taking, so A, A, E, C. And if I take the C way up here, I have that big gap, right? If I take that alto part, the clarinet part, up an octave, I have the gap in the middle. So what I'm going to do instead is play leapfrog. I'm going to take that tenor note and take it up an octave while leaving the clarinet note where it was. So my voicing is now, it still has a big gap in it, and that's because the original had a pretty big gap also, right? Um, it had an octave between uh, two of the voices. But um, it's maybe a little bit better. So what I want to do is take the horn part up an octave so it's above the clarinet. And I know you're all thinking, wait a minute, the horn's not going to want to play higher than the clarinet. It's going to be too, too high, too loud. But then what I want to do is swap the two parts. So I've taken the horn part up the octave, but now I will copy it, come over to the clarinet part, and use the command swap with clipboard. And that pastes the horn part onto the clarinet part while pulling the clarinet part into the clipboard, and now I come to the horn part and paste. So now I have the leapfrog thing happening. The, the What was the horn part is now in the clarinet, but an octave higher. And yes, I still have some wide gaps, but not as wide as I had before. And whether or not that gives me exactly the right answer or not in this particular piece, it is absolutely a trick to know about. Let's hear it, though. So based just on MuseScore's playback, that is my favorite of the bunch. I would still have to do some more thinking about where we are in everyone's ranges. And realistically, I might decide that, you know what, instead of playing these octave games, maybe I just put it in a different key. You know, maybe A minor is just not the key for this piece if it's going to be played by winds instead of strings. And maybe I'd be better off putting it in D minor and just putting everything up a fourth, right? So um, the question is, what combination of brass instruments would work? And that is a good question. So typically in a brass quartet, you're going to have trumpet, trumpet, horn, trombone. I mean, there's lots of different variations of brass groups, but typically you're going to have uh, two trumpets, horn, and trombone. That's going to be the foundation. Then if you're going to have a brass quintet, maybe you add a tuba. Maybe you add a second trombone, right? There's different, various different versions. It's Heiss here. He's going to have answers off the top of his head for uh, things like this. But let's think about that. Trumpet is the lowest note for a trumpet to play comfortably is probably this G below middle C written, which is really F below middle C concert. It's low. It is low. It's kind of like a flute low C, but it's there. So it's kind of like violin. The trumpet range at the bottom is more or less the same as violin. So in the same way that the viol that we let the violin handle both the soprano and alto parts, 
two trumpets can similarly handle soprano and alto parts if you don't write that alto part too low. Just don't push the lower range of the alto and you can use two trumpets. If you really need to push that range lower, well, then your alto is now a horn. And then you're either going to have two horns in the middle or this guy's a horn, uh, horn for the alto, trombone for the tenor, which is kind of wasting the trombone a little bit because the trombone can get into the bass range. But, you know, that's fine. And then you could have a, either another trombone for the bass or let a tuba or, you know, similar instrument, a baritone horn or euphonium or something else be the bass range, be the bass uh, yeah, be the bass part. So that that those are all possibilities there. For whatever reason, brass quintets seem to be at least as common as brass quartets. And I'm not, I'm not sure why that is a thing. And maybe it's just because they want to give a job to the tuba player also. I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know. Or maybe I'm just imagining that that really is as common as, as, as I think it is. But um when you're writing for a quintet, it's not that different from writing for a quartet. It just means you have another note to double. Instead of doubling rules be about which one note you double, well, now you got to think about which two notes to double. But that gets into another whole topic that's worth talking about here. I've off, often made the observation that um, uh, even writing for an orchestra is going to use a lot of the same techniques. So as uh, as SATB writing, you just do it one section at a time. So I want to take a look at Beethoven's uh, Fifth Symphony here, just because it's a reasonably familiar example. And we can talk about some of these same issues here. So first of all, the whole beginning is unison right uh right everyone has that exact same set of notes just in different octaves and then there's that more contrapuntal section right that that all that stuff with different rhythms but if you look at the chord that's being spelled out c e flat that is a g for the viola if you can read alto clef and then the cello curiously, is on a C here above the viola. And that's just the way it is. And that's fine. Um, and that's it, right? The, the bassoons are just doubling the cello. And so it really is a string quartet. Yes, violin one isn't a single violinist. It's a whole section. But it's the same thing, right? Whether, whether we think of it as a, um, whether we think of it as a um, single violin as it would be you know, two violins, viola and cello, as it is in a string quartet, or whether we have the whole section as we do for, um, I'm going to just do this, and then I'm going to bring in this guy and pin it so that I can follow the chat while I'm looking at this. Give me a sec. There we go. All right. Um, so, um, in this case, so yeah, we, we basically have the whole orchestra. It's just a big string quartet, right? That's what, what basically happens. And basses, notice that the basses are doing nothing. Well, this actually very well illustrates the point that I came here <laughs> to start and then totally forgot about. Just because you have five parts doesn't mean you have to use them all all the time. That's a common kind of beginner mistake in orchestration. Hey, I got five parts. I'm going to write for, I'm going to have all of them play all the time. Well, that's not usually a good idea orchestrationally because it just means your texture never changes. It's also not good for the players of wind instruments and brass instruments in particular to constantly be blowing. They need a rest. They need not just a beat of rest, but like, you know, eight measures of rest sometime to, to get their lungs back to normal kind of breathing. So um, I'm not saying you, you, you have to always do that, but it's, it's good practice. And so it's totally to be expected that if you're writing for a brass quintet at any given time, there might only be four instruments playing or fewer sometimes, right? If you flip back to my, uh, my choral piece, um, once I got into the counterpoint, it was only one voice and then only two voices and then only three voices. And the same is true in my uh, 
um, in my master class theme, the the bass voice, the cello or the bassoon in this case, continues throughout. But then as the counterpoint comes in, it's one voice at a time, right? So uh, it's expected that you're not always going to have all the voices on all the time, especially when you have more than four to play with. So here he chose to have the basses basically just not play. Now, when we get to these big chords here, yes, we got a lot of notes. You might be looking at that at that last chord. Ba -da -da -dum, bump. Um, and so let's take a look at that last chord here. This last chord, you look at it and go, well, gee, there's two flutes, two clarinets, two oboes, two, uh, two bassoons, two trumpets, two trombones, uh, TP. What the heck? Um, I wish I knew. Oh, timpani? Those are timpani? I think, maybe. Um, and then violins uh, and more violins, right? We've got a lot of instruments, but do we really have more than four things going on at once? I would claim, no, we don't. Uh, there's still only three notes in this triad. This is a G triad. And if we look at the two flutes, a B and a G, the oboes have those exact same two notes, an octave lower. So even though we got four parts, there's really only two parts. You know, it's just someone's doubling at the octave. The clarinets have a, once I transpose the concert pitch, a B and a D. And the bassoon has the G. So if you look at this, really, there's doom, two, three, and then four, five. There's five parts. So yes, the root is doubled, the fifth is doubled. Uh, I'm sorry, the third. The root and the third are doubled in that chord. But realistically, yes, it's four voices with one extra thrown in. If we look at the brass, the brass, uh, so these are horns here. C-O-R isn't cornet, it's corno, which is horn. And um, so I probably said trombone, and this is really trumpet. You know, you have to remember what the uh, abbreviations really were. So these are horns, these are trumpets, and that's timpani. Um, so these are just unisons, right? Those are that uh, E, th these horns are in uh, E flat, right? That, uh, oh, they're not even on that chord. The, 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 they've, they've, what the heck? Which chord am I even looking at? Yeah, I'm looking at that chord there. Uh, e flat means they sound a sixth lower than written. Well, a sixth lower than E is G. So those horns are playing a G. I hate having to do that math in my head for instruments that I don't work with every day, but um, but that's the situation. Those are G's. The trombone, the, the trumpets have G's because those trumpets are in C. Trumpets in C, even though it says trombe, I guess that's uh the the word for trumpet in the language at the time and the timpani is on a g right so these are all just unison g's we look at the um the uh um strings and we got a lot of g g g g in the lower strings the viola cello and bass and the upper strings just the triad and so second violin has those three notes. Uh, does it say divisi? Does it say non-divisi? I'm guessing that maybe those are meant to be double stops, but I'm, to be honest, not sure. Maybe some string player who's played this can let me know. So even though you've got a whole orchestra, you usually treat it a section at a time. And other than when you have double stops like we do here, that's really only five notes for, for your... Uh, um, strings, it's really only five notes for your winds once you account for doubling at the octave, which is going to be a common thing. Um, and uh, and your, your brass typically only like five notes. So really each section, you're dealing with only like five notes at a time at most, typically. And you, you'll just treat each of those using these SATD kinds of conventions. So when I talk about SAT being kind of a fundamental skill, um, and, and th thanks, Sayonara, I just saw your comment confirming that brass quintets are more common as far as sheet music being available. And is, I, I assume it's what I said, two, two trumpets, 
corn, trombone, and tuba. That's sort of the standard uh, instrumentation. But I, I know that there's a lot of variation, especially when you get into brass octets and brass choirs and so forth. So anyhow, um, again, SATB writing, kind of a foundational skill that when you get good at doing it, it's just a small step from there to then writing for larger ensembles. So definitely worth working on as a skill in itself. And that's what we're going to be talking about. So I look forward to seeing people submit some music over the coming uh, week. I'm going to post uh, also in the uh, workshop space uh, some other exercises uh, to work on if you want to get some practice doing chorale style writing. Uh, there's a great website that uh, Heist told me about that I'll share with you all later. Um, anyhow, that's, uh, that's the show. So I'm really looking forward to looking at some of this music and talking about all these issues of voice leading. Notice I'm not talking about harmony, right? I talked about harmony for the last four months when we talked about which chord was which. And here I barely talked about what chord was which. We just talked about chord tones and non-chord tones occasionally, but only occasionally. Mostly now we're talking about voice leading, spacing, those sorts of issues, and also some issues of rhythm, right? So those are the things that we're going to really focused on for the next few weeks. And again, really looking forward to hearing your music and uh, digging into this a bit deeper. So um, we will uh, talk later and have a great weekend.